um, in Kolyoj, uh, where's the, uh, now this is a hard word to say, where's the local, um, Lelele Yizwe, Mshetra's Trevor Manual. Can we welcome him? We're very honored to have him here because we are, we are very small and the country and its needs are very big. But the reason I asked him here is because he knows the power of community newspapers. Long ago, in the days of apartheid, he was part of a team and I saw one of his colleagues, Ryland Fisher here too, at the time. Hello, Ryland. Um, he was part of a team that launched one of the most important community newspapers in the Western Cape called Grassroots. It was a paper that was against apartheid, but the team who ran Grassroots also realized that unless you cover the problems of the community then, and the issues that are close to their heart, then nobody takes it seriously. So that newspaper became an important weapon in the fight against apartheid and for freedom. And Mr. Manuel was one of those also who fought hard for freedom. He was in jail for three years without even going near a court, because that's how things were in those days. Um, there's still many challenges. We don't live in those times anymore, but there's still many challenges we have to overcome to improve things in our country. And he knows that, because he was finance minister appointed by um, Utata Madiba in 1996 until 2009, the longest serving finance minister in the world. And every year his office would draw up a budget, and every year they'd give the most money to education. Um, and every year we see that our schools don't do well, but your schools do well because Nisa um, is a kakushin, and so you, you're learning a lot. Um, so it doesn't matter so much where you spend money, there are more answers that we need. But that's why you can be proud of your schools, and that's why I think our journalism students have learned a lot from, from working with you. Today, Mr. Manuel is Minister of National Plan Planning, and he has to deal with all these issues in the country, education, and jobs for people, and the places that we live in. So we're lucky to have him here. But he's also quite lucky to have his job, because he gets to meet people like you, or and to speak to you and find out what's going on in the country. So thank you very much, Minister Manuel. We welcome you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Green. Uh, thank you to all of you, but uh, can I say a big thank you to the poets? <laughs> it was very uplifting. And I want to say thank you to you and the teachers who support you in getting you because you need to make us very proud. Thank you for being here. I think that uh, the campus, the newspaper, the bringing together the community is very exciting. I also think it's very, very, very important that we recognize that whilst we are here, we've got this wonderful exhibition by Anderson. Now, I've never, I've seen, uh, I was saying to Mr. Smith, of course, I know this calls work, uh, but I've never seen an exhibition like this, and it's very, very, very exciting because part of what we need to understand is the media. And every picture that you see hanging on the wall tells a big story about life in South Africa. And many of these pictures were taken, I am not sure, how old were you in 1960? <laughs> um, many of these pictures go that far back into the late 50s and so on. But the image can never be erased. For as long as you have it, you will know that it happened. And that is so powerful because the gift of Ernest Cole wasn't just a Hasselblad camera in his hand. Because you could put any camera, you could put a very fancy digital camera in the hands of a person. But if the person has a way of seeing through the lens, mm. because that picture needs to be formed in the mind, like every story that a journalist writes needs to be formed in the mind, and that is the big difference. 
And we have this great gift, this great gift of, of, of the cold collection so that successive generations can see, so that you can see where this country was. You need to understand some of the hardships that people lived through to understand why people made the sacrifices that they did in this country. You see these pictures, you begin to understand why it was that people like Utatu Matiba, Nelson Mandela, decided to take up the struggle to bring democracy to the country. These pictures tell you why. And so in everything that media does, it's very important to, to say that you speak not just to those who read, but you speak to successful generations. And the way in which we speak is very important. Because there are trends I think we need to be alive to now. And one of those trends is that there's a growing gap that's defined in many ways by the access that people have to information. As I speak to you now, I know because I checked. I know in the city of the south of France, in Cannes, there's a big conference where President Zuma is attending. Uh, it's convened by President Sarkozy. I know who's there. I know what they're talking about. I can tell you about some of the things that's happening in the economy in China, in the economy in the United States, as we speak. Mr. Jelle, who was with me, was very surprised because on Tuesday morning I, I spoke at a, at a conference of statisticians and I spoke about the fact that the Greek Prime Minister had taken a very unusual decision to call for a referendum on the bailout from the European Union. And because information for me is real time, I have access, and that access that I have to information actually gives me a lot of power. I have that, and some of you in this room have that access to information. But I think it's something we must never take for granted, because the divide between the access to information that we have and what the majority has access to is very big. You see, it's a divide that's also present in the kinds of media produced for the majority of South Africans. I'm telling you that I would have read in the newspaper today about the discussions in Cannes yesterday. I would have read about the discussions in Athens yesterday. I would have read those things. But for the majority of South Africans, what the newspapers that they have access to give them is something about the life of some celebrity. It's an empty life, a hollow life. It's defined by what people wear. <laughs> I once saw an interview with one of the, I don't know what a celebrity is, and I tried to find out, and I, this, this woman was interviewed, and they say, so what are you famous for? She says, I'm famous for being famous. <laughs> <laughs> that is so intelligent. <laughs> and so what happens in society is that this, this gap, <coughs> between people who have access and people who don't, actually grows in leaps and bounds. Because while some people are trying to find out about big decisions that change our lives, other people are caught up with fantasy land of a world that they will never actually attain because some people have borrowed money to dress in fancy clothes and think that that's what life is. Uh -huh. And that divide is a divide that has to be bridged by media and new media that speaks to an audience that is focused on bridging the divide. Because right here in Mamalodi and Istris next door are young people who are trapped in poverty. They are unemployed. They can't even find taxi fare to get to Pretoria. They don't know where to look for a job. <coughs> the, the, the point at where they are and where the information is that they need to be able to change their lives is so big. 